The golden age of piracy was a time when men and women of fortune sailed the high seas, seeking riches, freedom, and infamy. Yet beneath the allure of buried treasure and swashbuckling adventures, a darker side of piracy prevailed, one that employed brutal punishments and extraordinary survival tactics. The world of keelhauling, marooning, and the enigmatic lives of pirates. Keelhauling Keelhauling wasn't just used by pirates. If you believe TV, even the Vikings used it. Many navies in the age of sail used it as punishment and even an extreme form of execution. Many, if not most times, the sentence was tantamount to death anyways. But if someone was ordered executed, it could be done more than once. Before we tell you precisely what keel hauling is, there are a few things we want you to think about for a moment. Have you ever been to the ocean shore, walked around the erosion barriers or rock wharves, or perhaps journeyed under the boardwalk? By the way, it's not as romantic as the 1964 song by the Drifters, Under the Boardwalk, Down by... Okay, the piers holding up the boardwalk and on the rocks are usually coated with barnacles, right? Sometimes large, sometimes small. Their size doesn't really matter. Barnacles are hard to remove. They're jagged and dirty. Lose your balance under the boardwalk or on the rocks, grab a barnacle-encrusted pier, and you're likely to rip the palm of your hand and fingers to shreds. They're sharp, and they carry all sorts of nasty microorganisms. Untreated, the risk of infection is high. Have you ever seen a boat, especially a wooden one, large or small, that's been docked at an ocean pier for a long time without proper care? Look in the water at the hull, probably a mass of barnacles. Ocean-going boat owners know they need to have the boat taken out of the water and scraped every so often. Barnacles multiply quickly and can weaken wooden hulls. But barnacles on wood or metal are a threat. They can foul propellers and fittings, corrode paint, and increase drag and fuel consumption. Where am I going with this? Here we go. Those punished by keel hauling were usually far at sea, and the barnacles probably covered much of the wooden hull below the waterline. But barnacles were only one problem. So before we go any further, let's tell you what keel hauling is. Think about it for a moment. The keel is essentially the spine of the ship, which protrudes into the sea, as you can see on this propeller-aided ship from the Age of Sail, complete with barnacles. When a man was keel hauled, he was bound by his wrists and ankles with two ends of the same rope. He was pushed into the sea, and the rope was made taut. This took a few moments, as many of the warships of the time had a wide beam or width, and their keel was often deep underwater. The famous HMS Victory of Trafalgar fame had a beam of 51 feet, and the depth of the hull was 21.5 feet. That's a long haul! <laughs> pardon, pardon the pun. So a man was thrown overboard, lingered there momentarily, and pulled by the ankle until the rope was tight against the ship. If running into the keel head first didn't kill you, the time you spent underwater might. A crew might be instructed to take their time and pause for a moment while the condemned was under the ship. If all that didn't get you, there were the barnacles. Yeah, here we go. If you've ever cut your hand while shucking an oyster or a clam, you know the shells can be incredibly sharp and cut deep. Large barnacles do essentially the same thing. The problem with barnacles is there's never just one. People were literally ripped to shreds. Literally. Here's the best part, okay? Ships in the age of sail, especially in the warmer waters of the Caribbean, were usually followed by schools of sharks. Mmm, primarily hammerheads and white tips, both known man-eaters. Crews tossed garbage, food, and human waste overboard, encouraging more sharks. Wow, the first man to be keel-hauled? Likely wouldn't have been bothered, but had multiple people been condemned? Well, imagine the horror on victim number two's face when he saw the first man, or what was left of him, pulled out and then looking down to see the multitude of sharks drawn to the ship by the blood. Now, we don't have statistics on how many people survived keel hauling, even if they didn't drown, weren't killed by a blow to the head against the keel, or had their skin scraped off by barnacles, the infection that set in was likely more than enough to kill them. Not a pleasant death. Survivors were usually given medical treatment, but aboard a ship in the age of sail at a time before modern antiseptic medicine, the odds of survival, well, you know, they are pretty low. <laughs> yeah. Most people who were keel hauled died, which means that it's likely they were not one of the famous captains of the late 17th and 18th centuries. In the Max series, Black Sails 2017, Edward Teach, more famously known as Blackbeard, is keel hauled. Yeah, never happened. Teach, who is famous for his long, thick black beard and his habit of carrying multiple single shot flintlock pistols on his chest, as well as grenades and a sword, was probably the most famous pirate of them all, and raided ports and captured ships in the Caribbean and as far as the Carolinas. 
He met his end in 1718 in a sword fight with Royal Navy Lieutenant Robert Maynard off the coast of North Carolina. Keach wasn't keel-hauled, but his body was thrown overboard for the sharks, and his head was mounted on the bow of Maynard's ship as a trophy. Most people who were keel-hauled were crewmen who mutinied or repeatedly disobeyed orders, like many pirate sailors, ended up on the captain's bad side. But it wasn't just pirates who keel-hauled people. The practice was relatively common in the English Royal Navy, Dutch Navy, and the French and Spanish navies. Wow. However, more often than not, especially in the Royal Navy, the punishment of choice was flogging. Given a choice between flogging and keel-hauling, I'd take a flog in any day. Keel-hauling by most navies was banned in the middle of the 19th century, if not earlier. Marooning The two most famous cases of marooning are of Robinson Crusoe and Captain Bly. Now, Robinson Crusoe was the famous fictional character in Daniel Defoe's famous novel, but it was not the title, at least not when it was published. The original title is The Life and Strange Surprising Adventures of Robinson Crusoe of York, Mariner, who lived eight and twenty years, all alone in an uninhabited island on the coast of America, near the mouth of the Great River of Orinoke, having been cast on shore by shipwreck, wherein all the men perished but himself, with an account how he was at last as strangely delivered by pirates, written by himself. Defoe wasn't just a writer, he was a superb marketer, for while Robinson Crusoe was fictional, he wanted the novel to seem as if it were the first-hand account of a man stranded on a deserted island. Still, Defoe got his idea from a true story, that of Alexander Selkirk, a Scottish pirate who disagreed with his captain about the condition of their ship, the Cinque Ports. In Selkirk's case, he actually requested to be marooned, as he believed his ship would not complete its journey. He was left in the Juan Fernandez archipelago, 416 miles west of Chile, with a musket, gunpowder, a Bible, tobacco, and a few tools. He survived alone on the island for four years, from 1704 to 1709, when he was rescued by a passing British ship. Selkirk became a celebrity whose story fascinated England, and Daniel Defoe wrote his famous novel in 1719. By the way, the Juan Fernandez Island is now called Robinson Crusoe Island. Another of the three islands is Alejandro Selkirk Island. The most famous case of marooning is part of three movie versions of the same famous story, The Mutiny on the Bounty, and is essentially a true story. As you may know, the HMS Bounty, captained by William Bly, was on a voyage of discovery in the Western Pacific when its crew mutiny, led by second-in-command Fletcher Christian. Mutiny was the most serious offense in the Royal Navy and most navies, and is to this day. The crew on the Bounty mutinied for several reasons, none of which was found to be sufficient in a later hearing. Still, Captain Bly was known for being a harsh disciplinarian and a tyrant who pushed the crew of the Bounty beyond what Christian and many of the crew thought reasonable. Remember, normal punishments at the time included flogging, restricted diet and isolation, and possibly keel hauling, which wasn't made illegal in the Royal Navy until eight years after the Bounty Mutiny, so Bly's command must have been especially harsh. And he was reprimanded for it at a hearing in England, though not punished. Some of the Bounty's crew wanted to kill Bly and his 18 supporters among the 46-man crew, but Christian and others disagreed and set the captain and his followers adrift in the ship's boat, a small skiff. They had food and water for just a few days when they were marooned about 4,000 miles from land in the Pacific. For 47 days, Bly and his crew suffered through stifling heat, thirst, hunger, storms, and more when they finally landed on the coast of the Dutch colony of Timor, one of the most incredible sea journeys in history. If you've watched any of the Bounty movies, you know that the crew landed on Pitcairn Island, a tropical island about 1,300 miles southeast of Tahiti, where they supposedly lived in paradise, had 24 children with the indigenous women. What many people don't know is that the famous Fletcher Christian was killed in a power struggle between him and other members of Bounty's former crew. This has been History on Fleek. See you next time.